Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? All good? How was lunch? Good lunch? Yeah. Not too tired after lunch? I hope not. I hope not. I will do my best to keep you awake. I'll do my very best. Okay, no jumping out of planes today or anything too extreme. Um, well, what we're talking about today is, uh, is saving the yaks or, or shaving them, so to speak. Um, and I'll explain more about that uh, during my talk. Uh, is anyone familiar with the, with the term to shave a yak? Yeah, not too many, but a couple, couple of hands, a couple of hands, excellent. Well, we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. Um, I'm very excited to be here at DevOps Days uh, Singapore. Uh, I was lucky enough to attend last year as well. Um, and special thanks to the organizers. I know, I know how much work the organizers of the uh, DevOps Days events um, go through. So thank you so much uh, to the organizers uh, for, for doing that. Um, it's a great volunteer effort to do that. Uh, so for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Anthony Rees. Um, I'm, I'm based out of Melbourne, Australia, and uh, I do work for Chef Software. I was, um, I was lucky enough to, be, to come from a development background. So uh, I, was, I was a developer who, uh, who started operating. And I think, um, I think the, most in, the most enjoyable part about uh, my transition uh, from uh, a, full, a full developer across into uh, more of an infrastructure-based landscape uh, probably took place when, when I, moved, uh, I moved strategically out of working for large service integrators. Uh, and I moved across and, and started and spent a couple of years working for, uh, for a, uh, a company that, uh, that really built infrastructure. And, and I think my background uh, as being a developer really helped to be able to assist uh, people from a, from a hardware-based platform uh, background. And, so, and, I, and I quickly realized that some of the, the most fun that I had was actually teaching those people. So using the skills that I had uh, as a developer to be able to help and to be able to train and to be able to uplift or teach new skills uh, to, to people that were, were more from an operator uh, background. And so whilst I came from a developer world learning to operate, the people that I, were, I was working with were operators who were learning to develop. And the, inter the most interesting part to me about this was, uh, was to, to see, when I first started working with them, uh, almost the fear in their eyes that they, they, had, to, they had to start writing code, right? Um, you know, I started talking to them about uh, source code management systems and things like that. And, and, and the most fun that I had was when uh, you watched these people start to become proficient and start, start to feel comfortable using those technologies. And of course, we, we, now, we now know that today to be DevOps, right? That's the DevOps practice. Um, can anyone, does anyone know the two bands that I'm referring to here in the slides? Yes, sir, in the front. Uh, Aerosmith and... Uh, uh, yep, Aerosmith, yep. Uh, no, not NWA, no, it's actually Run DMC, but you're close, sir. Yeah, good. So, um, of course, the, the reference that I'm using here is, uh, is, is when Aerosmith and, and Run DMC came together, right? So you had, had one, one particular rock band that came together, right? Um, our, our developer side coming together with our operations side, who were a rap band, right? Run DMC, very famous. Uh, and the two of them came together and... Uh, and they, they actually, uh, Run DMC actually covered an Aerosmith band, uh, sorry, an Aerosmith song. Uh, does anyone know the name of the song that they covered? Yes, sir. Walk this way, Walk this way. exactly, yep. Um, and well done. And, uh, and when, when, of course, when, when you bring two different groups, two disparate groups like that, you're breaking down a wall, aren't you? Yep. And of course, we, we know that today um, as being DevOps. Uh, but of course, we've got more challenges than just that today, haven't we? Right? So it's not just about bringing your development group and bringing your operations group together. Right? We've, got, we've got the challenges of public cloud. Right? Ops use cloud today. Developers use cloud as well. Um, and that could be a public cloud, it could be a private cloud. Right? You've got the ability to, to be able to do all of the same automation techniques uh, within, your, within your private infrastructure uh, as well. And, talk, and, and my talk today is, is centered around some of the techniques that, we'll, that, that you, can, you can potentially use. Hopefully I'll give you some tips and tricks on, on how to shave that yak, right? Because shaving yaks is not easy, they're really hairy, right? 
Um, and of course, you know, leveraging public cloud is, is not easy as well, right? Leveraging public cloud, um, even using, uh, using your own data centers, whether you're using technologies like, um, like VMware uh, on-prem or you're using Azure Stack uh, on-prem, maybe you might be leveraging something like OpenStack or, uh, or, or, or maybe other technologies as well for virtualization. Leveraging and, and automating those, those technologies uh, it is challenging, and it's challenging from a number of different ways because uh, you have to be able to continually learn. Right? Where, well, I, I refer to myself as a practitioner. I'm continually practicing. Right? I'm not an expert. I'm just continually learning things. Uh, when, I come to a, when I'm lucky enough to come to events like this and talk to people like yourselves, uh, I'm lucky enough to learn from you, uh, which, is, which is really great. And that allows me to keep practicing. That's why I'm a practitioner, all right? Now, one of the areas that we've always got to think about, of course, is security. And I'll be talking, uh, I'll be talking at length uh, about security today. Uh, everything that we do, of course, we're always thinking about testing, right? But we're also thinking about security as well, and it's just another part of the testing regime that we need to take. And the security side of it in a DevOps world can often be challenging. It can be challenging in many ways because you need to be able to work with your security group, but at the same, at the same time, the groups within organizations, especially developers and oper operations groups, they often see security as a roadblock. And that roadblock can be very difficult to overcome. I've I've worked with many customers um, over the years, and, and sometimes I've seen relationships that are so strained between the security group, um, and particularly maybe the developer group, or, or possibly even the operations group, that they're unwilling to, to even be in the same room together. Okay, that's a pretty extreme situation, but I've, I've seen it at a, at a couple of different organizations. And I wanna try and give you a couple, a couple of techniques today to even think about bringing, bringing you closer to your security groups. <laughs> because I don't want you to fall into this situation, right? That's not my job, yeah? We've all, we've all said that, haven't we? That's not my job. I don't have to do that, right? I don't need to move that branch out of the way when I'm drawing the white line down the side of the, down the, side of the road, do I? We can just go around it, right? We'll just go around that. That's a roadblock, yeah? If there's a, is it a dead, I think it's a dead lizard, right? <laughs> if there's a, the dead lizard in the middle of the road, we just paint over that. Right? Just keep going, keep painting. Right? That's what your business is telling you, isn't it? That's what your, what your, what your senior stakeholders, as, as IT professionals, you're continually being told, just keep painting, keep painting that yellow, those two yellow lines. Right? Doesn't matter what gets in your way. You know, DevOps will help you to be able to solve that, right? Yep, keep painting, keep drawing those lines. Yeah, well, it's not that simple, is it? Right. I know that's a little bit of an extreme example. <laughs> I hope I didn't upset anyone. Uh, yeah, so I hope no one's got a queasy tummy. Um, and again, you, know, you, you, see, you see the other one there where they've, where they've asphalted uh, right over the, the, the inspection hole, right? That's not my job, you know? I don't, I don't have to inspect what's underneath the road, you know, whether it's the, the sewer or whether it's the, the transmission cables which are going underneath it, right? That's someone else's job now. They're going to have to remove that road that I've just put over the top of it. I'm going to, I'm, if they cover up it any further, they're going to have to go looking for it, right? They're going to need to get the plans. And sometimes in, in the IT world, we're put under so much pressure that even the best of techniques or, or the best methodologies that you can use within your DevOps world, sometimes it'll still be difficult for you to be able to, uh, to manage that and to do the right thing. And so, and that's really what, what my talk is, is about today. Um, I'm gonna to be talking quite a lot about what I like to refer to as the enterprise paradox. And you know, whilst I'll have, I'll have many funny slides to be able to, de to depict that paradox, right? Um, what I really wanna be able to convey to you is that uh, a recent set of studies has found that more than 90% of, uh, of enterprises have identified automation, DevOps, and Agile as critical to the business performance. Now, there's no surprises there, right? I'm not expecting every, anyone here to take a photo of that slide because it's, you're all sitting here because you know that is true, right? I would say that the, the vast majority of your organizations see these as being critical, okay? There's no surprises there, but 
What you may be surprised about is that the survey found that less than 15% have implemented enterprise-wide best practices. And we know as IT professionals that best practices are what is going to save you at the end of the day, right? It's going to be able to help you to save the yaks or shave them, so to speak. And some of those best practices, they're not easy. They're not easy. They're not, not easy for good reason. Right? If they were, everyone would be doing them, wouldn't they? So it all comes back to my title of shave the yaks. Shave the yaks. So in terms of yak shaving, I'm going to be looking at a number of different areas. We'll take a bit of a look at the manual processes, uh, legacy systems and tools, and, and how, you, how, you can, uh, how you can better be able to utilize those, test with them, uh, security-based frameworks, et cetera. Uh, organizational silos, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, today as well. I've only got 40 minutes, so you have to imagine this is going to be, going to be pretty short, um, some of the areas that I've got time to talk on. Uh, large releases, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, large releases and how to be able to handle that. Um, and regulatory burdens. And so in terms of manual processes, obviously we're gonna, we're gonna spend a lot of time looking at automation uh, and also dynamic infrastructure, right? Dynamic infrastructure is always gonna help you with your le legacy systems and tools. Uh, we'll take a look at a, at a little bit of code and some open source projects that you'll be able to leverage. Um, I want you to be able to take away three or four things of interest to yourself that you can go off and play with, okay? So everything that I talk about today will be open source. Um, everything that I, that I talk about today will be free. Yep, free for you to go off and, and learn because as I mentioned before, we're all practitioners, right? We're all continually learning. Uh, we'll also have a look at, uh, at increasing the, co the cooperation and the trust within your organization. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about that too. And uh, the last two areas, uh, continuous delivery and infrastructure, I'll give you some ideas around visualization uh, because I think visualization for CI CD tools is probably the most important part of getting started, but also the most important part of testing and validating your pipelines. Okay, the visualization of them is probably the hardest. The reason why it's so hard is because continuous integration and, and continuous delivery as a concept Right, is, is made up of a number of different moving parts. Right? There's eight or nine pieces that, that make it up. And sometimes we have trouble articulating that, especially to, system, to, our, to our senior leadership, especially to our senior leadership to be able to get uh, the time and the, the value investment to be able to put into those areas. And the last area we'll, we'll take a quick look at um, is compliance at velocity. So we'll take a look at what some techniques that you can use uh, to be able to turn your, uh, your compliance, your auditing, um, and be able to use open source, open source tools uh, to be able to test those particular environments. All right. So that's going to be the, that's going to be the, uh, the crux of the talk today. Uh, we'll look at those particular areas. I'll break them up into a couple of, couple of, um, couple of uh, talking topics. And we'll concentrate and we'll zoom in on a couple of them and have a look at some code and also some cultural practices that you can use and leverage and take them off to your retrospectives um, or back to your teams and, and see if you can, uh, you can learn some value from those and, uh, and change the way that you work for the better. So let's kick it off with, uh, with automation is happiness. In terms of the automation piece, uh, obviously being at Chef, I work with a lot of customers who are interested in automation, yeah, kind of ironic really. Uh, but one particular area that I always find that our customers are struggling with is not the concept of understanding uh, configuration as code or infrastructure as code, however you want to refer to it. One of the areas that I find that they struggle with the most is, uh, is, is centered around the ability for them to be able to, to test and to test locally. So the ability for them to be able to stand up these particular environments really quickly, uh, test out all of their infrastructure as code uh, quickly and dynamically, and then tear it all back down when, when they're finished. Uh, and that could be uh, you want to be able to test it out when you're about to step onto a plane. Uh, it could be that you want to be able to test it out from uh, working at home, uh, or it could, you could be in the, in the office and, and have access to, uh, to, to larger amounts of, uh, of servers, um, et cetera, to be able to use and leverage. So this particular customer that I talked about, uh, that I was talking about before or alluding to is 
uh, is, is a very large enterprise organization, uh, but they were struggling with this concept. And uh, they, needed, uh, they needed something that was, that was easy for them to be able to use, but it was also very flexible because they have a lot of different technologies under, under their belt. Um, and I can, I can vouch that every one of you here in, in, in this room will be using a slightly different set of technologies and you'll need something that has a wide ability uh, to be able to, uh, to talk to different APIs and for you to be able to leverage those. And this customer was no different. And uh, we got them to have a look at Test Kitchen. Test Kitchen is a completely open source project. Um, and it's essentially just a testing harness and a testing rig that you can use uh, to be able to, uh, to execute infrastructure as code um, on many different platforms uh, in isolation. And it's an extremely, uh, it's, it's an extremely uh, uh, flexible um, solution. And it integrates with the majority of, uh, of the major platforms that are out there, um, meaning that it doesn't matter what technology you're using under the hood, um, you can use this. And as I, as I alluded to before, it's completely open source. Okay? Um, in terms of the, of the flexibility, what, what you're basically doing is you're defining the driver that you, that you want uh, Kitchen to be able to leverage for you. And the driver could be you know, based on a Vagrant-based driver. It could be on you know, Google Cloud Platform. Uh, you could be using uh, Docker-based containers, um, AWS. Uh, could be Azure. Uh, you might be using a VMware farm. Uh, maybe you might be using OpenStack. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. We've got drivers to be able to support you uh, when you use an open source tool um, such as Test Kitchen. And to not only uh, to give you the, the driver-based um, flexibility, uh, you're also going to need a, a set of provisioners uh, that will be able to give you the configuration requirements uh, that you need. And you, know, you need something that's going to support a range of different technologies there or a range of different uh, tools that you might be using. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether you're using, whether you're using Puppet or Ansible uh, or Chef. Uh, or salt stack, uh, the provisioners are being supported there uh, for you to be able to use them, which is good. Uh, can I just get to see, see your hands of, of who's, who's using different types of um, provisioners out of curiosity? Like who's, who's using Ansible um, in the room? Yep. What about our Puppet friends? Anyone using Puppet? One, okay. Um, what about Chef? Nice, good to see. Um, salt stack, anyone still using salt? Yep, excellent. Uh, so, Test Kitchen, um, as an open source tool, gives you that flexibility, gives you that ability to be able to, be able to use that. Um, and it's really quite simple to be able to use and to be able to set up. Um, and the, it basically works on a, on a kitchen.yaml file. It also ties into, uh, into a set of, uh, of tests, test, ca test case capabilities as well. Uh, we'll take a look at one of those open source ones um, a little bit later. We'll take a look at, take a look at InSpec. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit of working code. Uh, but uh, really the, the main premise, and uh, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll go and do a bit of a demo in a second. Hopefully it won't end up like, uh, like this gentleman here with a, with a fire extinguisher on fire, ironically. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll cross our fingers for that one. Um, and essentially what it looks like is... Just get my Mac to come back again. Hello, there we go. Right. So, is that big enough for everyone to see? So essentially what you do is um, you, you basically uh, create yourself a, a driver. Um, and once you've, once you've created that driver, this particular example is using, uh, using the EC2 um, uh, API on AWS. Uh, but of course it works on, works on Azure and Google and VMware and uh, OpenStack, etc. Um, you define the transport uh, and the provisioner that you want to go and you want to go and use. Um, as I alluded to before, um, works with with other provisioners, uh, not just Chef, of course. Um, and then you can then define the platform uh, that you want to be able to go and go and provision. Uh, so it works fantastic with with Linux and, and Windows as well. And uh, and then you can of course uh, create a, a number of, of sets of suites, um, essentially standing up multiple VMs if you require in parallel. Uh, so which is really handy and quick for you to be able to go and, and leverage. Uh, so a really handy uh, open source tool. Uh, in terms of, of being able to, to execute it, uh, very simple. It has a set of, basically a set of, of four commands. Um, and so those four commands essentially are there. They're based on, I'll go back to my slides actually. The, they're, they're based on, uh, on a set of commands uh, for kitchen create. Kitchen create will go and stand up that instance you require. Uh, 
Kitchen Converge will then uh, use Ansible or Puppet or uh, SaltStack or Chef, whatever you're using, to go and uh, make the changes uh, to, to, the, uh, to the image that you've, you've created. Uh, and then from there, you can uh, Kitchen Verify, which will go and, uh, go and test and use your testing integration to be able to do that. And then you can use Kitchen Destroy, and it'll blow the whole thing away for you. You can tie it into your favorite CI CD rigs. So you know, it works with Jenkins, works with uh, Bamboo, um, you know, VSTS, et cetera, uh, to be able to leverage. A really cool um, open source tool. Uh, and you can find out more information uh, at kitchen.ci okay, as, as an open source uh, tool. The second area that I wanted to talk about was uh, centered around community. And uh, what I wanted to do was, was to talk to you about your teams. Um, so as I said to, to, you, to you earlier, basically I'm going to do a bit of mixture of tech and a little bit of uh, a mixture of, uh, of cultural practices. Now everyone talks about empowering teams, right? Um, having uh, cross-functional teams is extremely, extremely important for you uh, as an organization. Um, and empowering your teams is, is really giving them the permission to be able to act um, and making sure that leaders uh, who care about uh, what you're doing uh, are there and enabling you and supporting you. Uh, but we need to be thinking about more than just empowering our teams. We need to be supporting women in tech, for example. Uh, for those of you that haven't gone and checked out um, the global uh, women in tech uh, seminars which are coming to you, um, you know, London, Glasgow, um, Amsterdam, uh, Sydney, California, uh, they're all covering off the, the women in tech uh, areas and the specific women in tech uh, conferences. And of course, for us to be more successful as IT specialists, we need to be supporting these types of initiatives. Um, I'd love to see Singapore um, on the list very soon. I'm sure Singapore are working on this. Uh, but these types of initiatives um, are, are very, very important. And this helps to be able to build our community. Our community are extremely important. This, uh, up on the, up on the uh, board there, that's, uh, that's the chef community at large. And we have, we have a, a really important uh, message that we try to convey. And it's really centered around uh, collaborative inclu inclusion uh, for change. That's really what we're trying to do from our, from our communities of practice. How many of you out there are using centers of excellence? How many, how many, how many, how many groups, uh, how many organizations are, are using center, centers of excellence here? Okay, so centers, I want to concentrate on centers of excellence for this particular piece, and I'll explain to you why. Many, many organizations do use centers, centers of excellence, and centers of excellence do help to get you started, uh, but essentially, Centers of excellence are really centered around uh, excellent people being, being part of that group. Okay? To be part of it, you have to be excellent. Uh, but they're also they're, they're really centered around, uh, around inviting people to become members. And so I'd rather, I'd rather we look at things from a community of practice standpoint. And creating communities of practice means that anyone can be part of that group. And being part of that group doesn't mean that you need, need an invite. It really means that you just need to get involved, right? And becoming involved in, in, a, in a community of practice means that you're getting lots of different people who feel, who feel like they're allowed to be able to attend. They feel as if they can come. It's not a center of, center of excellence where they have to be invited. And the center, center of excellence is creating technical roadmaps and providing uh, white papers that the organization needs to be held accountable to. Right, We're doing away with that and we're creating a practice where everyone is invited and everyone is allowed to be a part of the group. So I would stress to you that rather than using centers of excellence, create yourself communities of practice and really start to involve everyone as part of your organization. Compliance at, at Velocity is another area that I wanted to be able to talk about uh, for a little bit and I also do a bit of a, a demo. Um, I work with many, many customers uh, that leverage, uh, leverage, uh, leverage uh, uh, CIS-based standards, so the Center for Internet Security. And they usually have enormous amounts of documentation much like this. Yeah, so their security audit team come in and I, I alluded to the fact earlier that the security team is often seen as, uh, as being, a, as, as being a, a, a roadblock, right? Um, they walk around with huge folders like this and they're holding you accountable um, as dev teams and operations teams. And they're really, uh, 
they're really seen as this, right? So you're, you as operation, operations people and developers are working with the product team to be able to create uh, the, the features from the ideas that that team is coming and creating. And you get to the security review and it, it's really holding back all of the, holding back all the water, right? It's, it's a massive roadblock that you have. And to get into production, you have to jump this huge wall um, and I can tell you now, jumping from the top of that wall down into the production environment, if you don't have a parachute, you're going to be in a lot of trouble, right? It's a long way down. And so what we find is that, you know, the, the IT groups, they, 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 take, they take other avenues, right? They go around that rock wall and they abseil down the side of it, or they, they get themselves a base jumping parachute and they go and jump off the side, right? And when we go and do things like that, we put ourselves at huge risk. Right? We're actually going against the ability uh, of what the security team are really trying to provide in the first place. And I believe personally that some of the, the major reason for this is that the different groups are, are using a different type of methodology in the way that they're building or the way that they're constructing um, these particular areas. What they're doing is you've got your DevOps groups that are, that are using programming languages. You've got your security group who are using some sort of sort of, sort of shell um, script. Uh, you know, using, they're using grep and they're using other types of uh, other forms of, of media like that. Um, and then your compliance group are walking around with huge Excel spreadsheets printed out into uh, in, in, into huge document form and trying to hold you accountable to that. And all you're doing is banging your head against the wall, right? Like this guy here, yeah. And all that gives you is a headache. Yeah, I can tell you that. It give you a really big headache. So really what we want to do is be able to use a similar type of, of language to be able to describe all of this. And there's one way that you can do that. Um, so one particular way is an open, is an open source project called, uh, called Inspec. It allows you to be able to, uh, to, be able to describe different, uh, different resources uh, and, and service controls uh, in, a, in a language that is completely human readable. Um, it's an open source project uh, and of course you can get involved with it and, and contribute to it. Uh, but the interesting thing about it is it works on a range of different platforms. So for those of you that are using Windows, yep, no problems. Uh, those of you that are more Linux, uh, Linux focused like myself, no worries. There's, there's a lot of support for that too. Um, and being human readable, uh, it makes it a lot easier for you uh, to be able to get your security and your compliance people across the line. That as I alluded to before, you know they're not always um, they're not always as, as comfortable as you might be. Uh, in, in being able to, uh, to read code. So, what does it actually look like? Well, if my Mac comes back to me, there we go. Uh, so basically, uh, Inspec is, is a language. It's based on RSpec. And, uh, and it looks just like this. Hopefully that's big enough for you to read. Um, so this is actually a set of checks which is used for, for checking uh, the installation of a SQL Server 2005 um, installation. Uh, so basically you can go and check things like ports and make sure that the correct ports um, should be listening or, uh, or negative testing, like uh, should, not be, should not be listening. Uh, you can also go and, and check for, for services, um, the ability of those services to be run um, in different states, enabled um, and, and, and running in a, in a running state. Uh, check the different directories that are that are being created, whether they're being created in the right states, uh, and whether the correct privileges have been added to those uh, to those particular um, environments. Uh, and what you can do is you can essentially go and take things like the Center for Internet Security, so uh, those those huge those huge documents uh, that your security group are, are holding you accountable to. Uh, you can take that that information and you can turn it into code with this with this open source project. Uh, and then continuously run them. So again, tie them back into your CI/CD pipeline. Uh, tie them in there and, and use them to be able to, uh, to make your, uh, your continuous delivery uh, a lot more functional and, uh, and have the ability for you to be able to, uh, to, to leverage that and make sure that your environments are continuously, are continuously uh, being compliant. And that's sort of a segue across to, to the last area that I wanted to cover for you today. Um, I think I'm getting pretty close to, to the end of my time. Um, and I wanted to cover off quickly uh, continuous delivery. And I think I alluded to the fact before that 
you know, we all look at continuous delivery in, uh, within our organizations as, uh, as a set of stages and a set of phases, right? Everyone has a slightly different, uh, different opinion on, on what that will be and organizations use different ways and different methodologies to be able to do that. Um, I'm not going to get too, uh, too fanatical about the technology that you're using. Um, if you are using continuous delivery, I think that's just a really great start. But the one thing that I always find that organizations have when they're trying to define these particular, uh, these particular sets of stages and, and phases that they need to go through is that they often struggle with the ability to be able to define it. Um, I'm a big fan of defining that as code. Whatever you need to be able to do, I think you should always be able to define it as code and uh, be able to version control that, right? Um, and a really great way to be able to do that that I've found um, is to use, the, use the, the Jenkins plugin to be able to do that. You can, uh, you can define it as a, as a Jenkins file. Um, it's completely open sourced, uh, which is great. Um, and when you do that and you actually uh, push it into the graphical UI, uh, you come out with really great uh, ways to be able to show it and uh, you, you can obviously version control all of this. Um, and when it's, when it's put into the, into the UI, you can create your, your pipelines um, to look like this. And when you're able to visualize that information, you can then replay this to your senior leadership team. You can show them the value and articulate the value of the pipelines, um, how, they, how they relate to each other, because you're going to have complexity in your pipelines, obviously. You're going to have pipelines depending on pipelines depending on pipelines. And when you're able to be able to visualize it much like this, you can get a lot of support from your senior leadership to be able to get the time, get the investment to be able to create those pipelines to be able to save, save your, your team time and to be able to create repeatable artifacts because that's what we're trying to be able to do. Create repeatable artifacts that are, that are quicker time to value, quicker time to market. And if your team are able to be able to write them to look like this and output them to your senior leadership in a way that they can understand it, you will get a lot more support. And that's what we're all looking for. As DevOps practitioners, we're looking for senior leadership support. And if we give, it, if we give them technology solutions articulated in a way that our senior leadership can, can understand and support, you'll be able to get a lot further in, in your daily work. I hope you found uh, three or four things that you can take away um, from today that would be helpful. Um, I saw a few of you taking, taking photos, so hopefully it was, uh, it was useful for you. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. It's a, always a pleasure to, uh, to see everyone in Singapore. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference, and, uh, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. When we started Devil Space uh, about four years ago, it was very much around the communities. So I, I kind of felt that you, you're sending the message to stop uh, creating centers of excellence and start building communities of practice. And I think that will be an excellent topic for an open space discussion, because I think a lot of people need the help to understand how can they build a community of practice in their companies. So. Uh, I, I propose it. Uh, if you can see it, it just has one vote. So I will ask everyone if you think that that's a great topic to have the discussion during the open spaces, please vote it up. And I hope you, Anthony, will, will share more lessons and uh, I'd love to. How, how to do it properly. That's great. Thank Thanks, Sergio. Thank you very much. Thank you, and everyone. Now we will switch to you.